Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, I think most of my introduction has already been done by, uh, by Martin. Uh, as he said, my name is Jasper Hemmes. Uh, I'm 22 years old, and now I'm working on the Nuon Solar team. Um, I completely stopped studying for a year and a half to be part of this team, and today I will talk to you a bit about how it is to be on this uh, team. So here you have our team. Uh, there you see me. I had quite some longer hair uh, a couple of days ago. <laughs> But um, here we are, we are a team of 16 students, and with the 16 of us, we design and build a solar-powered car with which we compete in solar races. Um, we all have different backgrounds. Uh, we all are students from Delft, but we have industrial design students, or aerospace engineers, or electrical engineering students. So almost every study from Delft has someone in our team. And we all man different functions within the team. As Martin said, I was the aerodynamicist, so I took care of the aerodynamic design of the car. Uh, and we have electrical engineers, we have people responsible for the marketing and for the public relations. So we really have everything. And what I think is special about this team is the mindset. Um, we all work full time on this project. We stopped studying for a year and a half. And uh, when, when things get busy, we really work uh, work weeks of 80 hours. And for the entire year, we get to have 12 days off. Um, and what this means is that we work really hard on it, but we decided ourselves to do that. We're a self-guiding team. Uh, we decided the working terms, and there's not really anyone telling us what we should do. Um, that doesn't mean, obviously, we don't get any advice, um, because from the old team members, we do get a lot of advice. Uh, we're all students at Delft University of Technology, but building a solar car isn't really something you learn during your studies. Um, so we do get a lot of advice from old teammates. Um, they come by, I think every day there is at least one alumnus uh, coming by the office just seeing how we are doing at that point. And um, we also organize design reviews in which we present the design we have made so far. And then all the alumni come by and just give us tips on, hey, look at that, you haven't thought about that. Because they have already seen those problems that we are facing right now. And I think that's a really great extension of our team of 16 to have all the old team members behind us helping us to win the next race again. So what do we do is that we race the solar cars and we do that in Australia and in South Africa. Um, we started participating in Australia in 2001 and that really is the world championship of solar car racing. And the first time we participated, we won it uh, already. And since then, we have participated ever since. Um, as Martin said, it's a two-yearly event, so there's one year without a World Solar Challenge. And then in 2014, we decided to participate in another race in that year that has no World Solar Challenge. Uh, that turned out to be South Africa. And what really nice is about that is that in the year that we are participating in Australia, we have to build an entire new car, and that takes a lot of time. And that doesn't give us much time to do all the research projects that we would like to do. But in the South Africa race, we don't build a new car. We use the old car from the old Australia race. Um, but then we do have the time to look into all those research projects we don't have time for when building, when building the new car, meaning that the next car we build for Australia has improved even more. <coughs> Well, um, as Martin said, our history is quite uh, impressive about this. We're really good at this. We participated in Australia eight times, and we won six out of those eight times and came in second the other two times. And uh, since we participated in South Africa, we've won both times also. Um, so to say, we are really the best solar car racing team in the world at this moment. <clears throat> and then looking at that history and the theme of today, Discover, Fill, Reflect, Adapt, we really don't have any room for failure in Australia. If we don't win, to us it would a bit feel like that we have lost. Um, but obviously we can't really think uh, that everything we think of goes exactly as we planned. You can't expect that. So in the design process there is a lot of room for failure uh, so that it can fail then and not during the race. Yeah, before going into the design process, I'm going to talk a bit about our working method. Uh, is that we use Scrum. Uh, you might know it, you might not. And it basically means that you look at all the tasks you need to require um, to build a solar car. So you should have a good suspension, you should have a good electrical system. And then we start breaking down all those tasks into smaller tasks, and we keep doing that until you have bit-sized to-dos that we write on post-its and put up on the board. Um, an example could be that you want to have dinner, and therefore you have to uh, get your groceries, and then you have to cook your dinner. 
That would then be two tasks in order to complete the dinner task. And then um, to get to groceries, you can break it down even more, and you can say, OK, I first have to go to the supermarket, then I have to pick my groceries, I have to pay them, and then I have to go home again. And then you have bite-sized tasks, to-dos, as we call them, um, and it allows you to work in a very structured way. And also another great thing that this allows you to do is to finish each other's tasks. Um, because the workload isn't that evenly distributed throughout the entire year, and sometimes some people have just much more work to do than others, and every morning we stand with each other at these whiteboards and just explain what we're going to do today, and if someone is going to be very busy, that would mean that someone else can do some of his tasks to evenly distribute the workload. And as a team, to be that dynamic that really greatly increases the efficiency of you working as a team on the goal that you're going for. <clears throat> uh, but now back to designing. The designing of our car um, really starts with the rule book. Uh, every new edition of the race, there is a new set of rules that our car should be, uh, yeah, sh should complain to. Um, and what they do, they really change the rules quite a lot every year, so that the previous car simply doesn't comply with the rules of the next race. And the reason they do this is to keep pushing, pushing us to think of newer and better and smarter ways to get faster every race. And another reason why they do this is because we keep getting better at it and the technology keeps getting better and they don't want us to be able to reach the speed limits of the public roads we drive on. So uh, that's another small reason. Here you can see a big change. Um, at first it didn't really matter and then they said in 2015 you have to have four wheels in your car. Uh, might not sound as a big change, but for the entire concept and building up of the car, it really is uh, big for us. This year, the big change is that uh, from six square meters of solar arrays that all previous cars have, or even more, uh, we're only allowed to take four square meters, so the entire car will become even smaller and gives us a bit more room to play around with the design, and uh, I think it'll become very interesting. <clears throat> When we know the rules, we can start brainstorming and thinking of different concepts that fit within those rules, and then we quickly start analyzing all those concepts. And in the beginning, we had, we had hundreds, and you can easily see that that one doesn't make sense, and that one doesn't make sense. You can easily cross them away. Um, but in the end, you, you end up with maybe 10 or 15 pretty reasonable concepts, and then we start analyzing them um, yeah, as fast as possible, because you don't really have time to get into detail of all those 15 concepts. So you have to yeah, use rules of thumb or really calculations that don't go into too much detail to calculate what the performance will be of that concept. <clears throat> um, eventually this year we ended up with two concepts that were sort of inseparable. You couldn't really see why the one should be better than the other one. And it felt to me like a bit of a gamble on which one we were going to choose. Um, but in the end, during the process of designing it in more and more and more detail, we actually noticed that we did make the right choice and we have chosen a very great concept. <clears throat> and I think something interesting to tell is how we make decisions in, for example, choosing a concept or how do we make decisions during the designing of the car. And we do that using racing minutes. Um, I'll just give you an example. Uh, for example, I, as aerodynamic engineer, I want the wheel covers to be two centimeters thinner. That would mean the car would have less aerodynamic resistance, so less drag, as we call that. <clears throat> and that would mean that we could reach the finish line faster. But now the suspension, which is in that wheel cover, should also fit in that smaller space. And we might have to add metal to have the suspension still be able to withstand all the loads that it should. Uh, that would mean, for example, that we add a kilogram of weight in the car. So we then choose for a faster but heavier car or a slower but lighter car. So that's a very hard decision to make. And then we turn into racing minutes. Uh, so we have rules of thumb saying, OK, for example, um, if you reduce the drag by a certain amount, you reach the finish line 10 minutes faster. So over 3,000 kilometers, you'll be 10 minutes faster at the finish line. And similarly, we look at, OK, if you add a kilogram to the car, um, you would reach the finish line three minutes later. And then it's just a simple sum. You say, OK, 10 minutes plus, minus 3. If we go for the heavier car with less drag, we are going to reach the finish by seven minutes early. <clears throat> and that's how we make decisions in the team. And that really is sort of universal language with, yeah, between the disciplines in the team that we can uh, all agree on the same thing, because we have the same goal, and that is to reach the finish line as fast as possible. <clears throat> 
Then when we have chosen the concept, we really dive into the detailed design. We now have only one concept left and we can get into all the details. Um, first, it is important to know who the drivers of the car will be. So we measure everyone from the team. There's, they're all just team members, the drivers. And um, yeah, in essence, the three smallest team members, they become the drivers. Um, the weight isn't that important because the weight is filled up to 80 kilograms. But I mean, the size of you is very important for the aerodynamic design. And well, obviously, I'm not uh, being a driver. I'm, <laughs> I'm too large for that. <laughs> But um, then in the end, we end up with the entire car drawn in 3D. So all the parts, all the components have been drawn in this, in this CAD model. And then we can start producing those parts. Whereas the biggest one is the carbon body of the car. So we have the molds, and then we layer carbon fiber mats into those molds with resin to create a very lightweight and strong body of the car. Um, <clears throat> and it's actually kind of similar to paper mache. So you just layer all those things, and instead of using newspapers and glue, you use carbon fiber and special resins. Um, this production is, again, a point where the team should be very dynamic, because we have five team members now going into full-time production. They leave our office in Delft. And as, as I just said, um, we're doing that in Zwolle right now, in the Polymer Science Park. That's where we are producing the car. And five teammates now left our office, and they are now doing something completely different than what they were planning to do in the beginning. And yeah, again, that, that is something very important, we think, just be dynamic and be at the point where you should be or where you are required instead of just clamping yourself to the pre-assigned role you had uh, when you entered the team. During this production phase, um, we can already start the testing in the Netherlands. Uh, here you see our testing mule, which is just an aluminium frame. And it's really valuable to us because now we and have the possibility to test the suspension and the electrical system even before we have the carbon body finished. So we're producing that right now, but we're also already testing parts right now that we have. And uh, secondly, if, someone break, if something breaks, uh, then we would ruin this aluminum frame and we wouldn't ruin the carbon fiber body we're creating uh, because that takes three months to make and we really don't have time or resources to make another one. So uh, that's why we use our testing uh, vehicle, which is named Benny over here. And then in the end, we, yeah, the, the carbon body is finished, and we get to finalize the car. And then also we test that in the Netherlands. Um, we test it at large ovals, where we can just drive constant at speeds of 100 kilometers an hour, because that is the most realistic racing uh, scenario for us, just constant speeds of 100 kilometers. <clears throat> and furthermore, this is a nice moment for our drivers to get to know the car. Um, it's, pretty different than driving a normal car. It's very lightweight. All the weight is at the same side of the car, so it's really asymmetrical. And this is great for the drivers to yeah, get to know the car. Then in the end, when uh, the race comes near, we pack up everything and we move to Australia. And there we have several weeks again to do some more testing. And we also uh, take the time there to practice our protocols, which you see happening uh, in this picture. And with that, I mean, for example, changing a tire or rotating the car or lifting the solar panel. That's things that you can really win something compared to your opponents if you do it fast. In South Africa, we have clocked ourselves changing a tire in one and a half minutes, and we've seen our opponent do it in 10 minutes. Well, that's an immediate eight and a half minute win that we have onto them. And that's why we really yeah, train that a lot. I think similar to Formula One pit stops, we just practice and practice and practice, and everyone knows exactly what to do at what time uh, when, for example, changing a tire. And then eventually, when the race comes near, um, we go through scrutineering, which is the process where the organization checks if our car complies with the rules. And then we go through the qualification, where we race it around a track to determine who gets to start first. And then eventually, we get to start the race. Um, Race takes about four to five days, four and a half, we calculated. And uh, you start in the morning at eight, and then you drive until five in the evening. And where you are then, we just stop, put up our tents, and that's where we sleep for the night. <laughs> and uh, well, yeah, then in, in four and a half days, we, uh, we are going to reach the finish line, hopefully first again. And um, yeah, as I said, we really have no room for failure here. So coming in second would feel to us a bit as a failure. But in the year leading to it, we really do have enough room for us to fill. Thank you. <laughs>